NC Impact is made possible by funding from Civic Federal Credit Union. NC Impact is a production of UNC TV Public Media North Carolina in association with the University of North Carolina School of Government. I knew immediately something was wrong. About one in 10 Americans aged 60 and older have experienced some form of elder abuse. And they need to know that they are valued, they are seen, they are heard, and they know that they matter to somebody. How a North Carolina community is preventing these types of cases and protecting a vulnerable population. This is NC Impact. I'm Anita Brown Graham and welcome to NC Impact. This week, we're looking at ways people can come together to prevent elder abuse in their communities. Joining us are Meredith Smith, my colleague at the School of Government at UNC, Marjorie Brown, an attorney who specializes in elder law, and Detective Scott Sluter with the Winston-Salem Police Department. Our panelists today have thoughtful ideas about protecting older adults in our communities but they want to hear your ideas and questions too. This year marks 10 years since 80-year-old Tom Cooper was abused and killed in his Johnson County home. NC Impact's David Hurst sits down with Cooper's family and learns why preventing elder abuse has become so very important to them. This is just my dad's flyer that hung up for months before they made an arrest. In the 10 years since Stacy Franks lost her dad, she's learned to hold on tight to the memories. He was funny and fun with his stories, but he was a, he was a great man. Nearly two days after James Tom Cooper was found dead here, crime... On a summer afternoon in 2010, Franks and her brother checked on their dad, 80-year-old Tom Cooper, at his Johnston County home. The house was locked, but Franks looked through a window and saw her dad lying on the kitchen floor. I knew immediately something was wrong, immediately, and I turned around, you know, and told my brother, I said, it's bad. Sheriff's deputies ruled the death a homicide, and six months later, they arrested a woman named Crystal Worley and charged her with first-degree murder. Detectives say Worley stole from Cooper while she was helping him with some work around the house. And they said that there must have been a confrontation and he told her he wasn't going to pay her because she had stolen from him. And that is when, during that confrontation, she killed him. Worley maintains her innocence and ended up accepting a plea of a lesser charge. Frank says she believes Worley took advantage of her father because of his age, thinking he'd be an easy target. I think she just, she needed help and she just took advantage of him. Ten years later, Franks is learning to talk about these closely held memories of her father, and she says she wants to use her dad's death to shine a light on those who target and abuse older adults. It's so wrong. It's so wrong. It's... To me, older people are innocent just like kids are. It's, it's wrong to take advantage of people. Again, to our great panelists, welcome and thank you for being with us. Marjorie, I'd like to start with you. What, what do the words elder abuse mean? What are the different types of elder abuse that communities could be concerned about? Well, I'll give you the, the somewhat legal and um, uh, definitions first and then I'll break it down from there. So North Carolina kind of has three different definitions of elder abuse. So one of them is literally where it says it's the willful assault or confinement or restraint of someone who's aged 60 years or older who is unable to protect or care for themselves by a caretaker. Okay, so then the second definition has to deal with gross negligence. So again, we're still dealing with a caretaker in the person's home, but due to their gross carelessness, they fail to provide medical or hygienic care, confinement or restraint that results in a physical or mental injury of a person who's aged 60 years or older, again, who cannot take care of themselves or protect themselves. The last definition has to do with uh, exploitation or financial exploitation. 
And so that one has to deal with someone who's age 65 or older. It doesn't have to deal with whether or not they are able to or not able to protect or care for themselves. It just has to do with their age. And it has to do with them being intimidated or by deception by someone who has a is in a position of trust uh -huh. or someone just, you know, the basic phone calls where somebody calls and tries to, you know, scam them and take their money. And so through their intimidation or deception, they try and deprive them of their assets. So what strikes me about all of these is the breach of trust. Um, so let me go to you, if I might, Meredith. Just We're all more worried about everything these days, but how prevalent is elder abuse in our state? So, Anita, I think, as Marjorie just highlighted, one of the challenges in this field is determining the prevalence because we don't have a single definition of elder abuse in our state or nationally. Um, what we do know is that it is prevalent from national estimates. Uh, one 2015 review published in the New England Journal of Medicine estimated that one in 10 adults over the age of 60 are subject to some form of abuse um, in their life. And uh, we know that North Carolina has no reason to have less. Um, in 2017, 40% of our population was age 60 or older. We expect that by 2037, that number to rise to 50% of our population. Um, um, but we lack a single definition in North Carolina and a single collecting agency. And so that, that creates challenges for determining the precise prevalence level. What we do have is an incredibly robust mandatory reporting law through our adult protective services with each county department of social services. Um, and that applies to di all disabled adults over the age of 18. Um, any person who has reasonable cause to believe that a disabled adult is uh, in need of protective services in North Carolina is a mandatory reporter. That is any person um, that is required to make a report to our county department of social services. Um, there are very limited exceptions to that law uh, for ombudsman, but for most of us, we are all mandatory reporters. So, Detective Sluter, I want you to weigh in on this because usually you are waiting for these cases to come to your attention. What do you do when the cases are hidden in plain sight? Well, I think one of the things you have to do is to, to try to, you know, certainly work um, work with the local community partners that you have, whether it's adult protective services, financial institutions. Uh, social groups or networks that are geared towards uh, the elder population. I think you have to work with them just to cultivate the relationships and so that you may not have, I'm, there are times I don't have a report on my desk, but yet I may get a phone call. I may get an email that says, hey, I think you need to check on this. So that's something that working with those partners and developing the relationships is something that can help uh, provide information as soon as it can come in. And to the point that Marjorie was talking about, I also think COVID has also done a lot to shut down the resources that are utilized to help um, intervene and provide safety for these individuals. Um, you know, the, the social workers are, a lot of them are working remotely. Um, there, I know our group locally, our MDT in Forsyth County, uh, hasn't met as regularly as we used to. We're trying to still meet uh, virtually, uh, but I think that builds a communication barrier there. And uh, so trying to, trying to keep the relationships going, keep the communication going is the best thing to do to help work through problems as they uh, arise. We're going to come back and talk about what an MBT is in a moment. Preventing elder abuse can be complicated. In Johnston County, community leaders have formed a multidisciplinary team to collaborate in addressing elder abuse cases and see impacts. David Hurst reports. For Wendy Whitfield, a tattoo on her wrist is a constant reminder of the relationship she had with her grandmothers. They are the reason that I do this work. And as I grew up and watched them age, I watched them become more and more um, trusting of people in the community and people um, taking advantage of that trust. Alongside her work with social services, Whitfield is a member of the Johnson County Multidisciplinary Team. It's a team of professionals committed to preventing elder abuse in their community. We can pick up the phone and just call them and collaborate on a case. And we have the ability to um, understand what their lanes are and what, what they are allowed to do in their lane versus what we can do in our lane. The team is led by the county's clerk of Superior Court, Michelle Ball. Ball says it's difficult for one single agency to prevent or intervene in abuse cases, and the partnerships are making a difference. 
One thing that's exciting is so many partners in the community are interested just like I am in making sure that we're taking care of the elderly people. And it doesn't take but a few minutes of talking to them about what we've got going on and what we're doing, and they're on board. They're ready to help. The clerk's office works with the DA's office, Department of Social Services, and the Sheriff's Department. They share resources, information, and work together on cases of abuse and exploitation. We were able to see that all these groups, if we work together, we could make a difference and we could give better answers than just giving people a guardian and not really knowing completely what was going on. And that is what's important about this population. For Whitfield, the work is a way to honor her grandmothers and help those she believes are among the most vulnerable in the community. They need to know that they are valued, they are seen, they are heard, and they know that they matter to somebody. We just saw Johnston County's multidisciplinary team that's working to prevent elder abuse. Meredith, let me start with you. How many other counties in North Carolina have these types of teams, and how effective are they? Well, um, what we know is from state data uh, from 2018-2019, uh, when asked, uh, when they asked each of the counties, uh, the 100 counties in North Carolina, 20% of the counties identified already having a multidisciplinary team in place. 20% said that they were working to build one. Um, but I think that data is probably already somewhat out of date. We've seen an incredible movement recently uh, towards the growth of MDTs in North Carolina. And quite frankly, what we are really seeing is there are so many communities where there are passionate actors, uh, professionals around this topic, and they may have been operating informally for a number of years. What we're seeing a trend towards more recently is this sort of formalization, putting a name on it, right? They might have already had a, a community group that got together to respond to these cases, but they didn't label it an MDT. They might have called it their elder justice team or their elder abuse task force, um, but sort of formalizing these relationships, putting in place memorandums of understanding, information sharing agreements, trying to uh, crystallize what it is and how to sustain it over time is, is really a trend we're seeing, as well as um, expanding who is at the table beyond just governmental actors. Bringing in hospitals and geriatricians and financial institutions is another trend we're seeing. So um, I think, uh, you know, by way of their effectiveness in the community, um, we, we have really few large, high-quality control studies on MDTs. They are recognized as a best practice by the federal and state government. Um, and uh, identified as a possible intervention on these um, types of cases. Um, we see a lot of benefits of pulling people out of their silos um, and, and into a more collaborative relationship to use community resources effectively, uh, efficiently for the benefit of the citizens in that community. So the benefits seem clear and, quite frankly, the outcome gives me hope. But we never want to make it seem as though this stuff is easy to do just because it's good to do. So Marjorie, let me turn to you. Um, what kinds of challenges and obstacles are communities likely to face when they're working together collaboratively to prevent elder abuse? So one of the things is uh, knowledge. So Cabarrus County also has a task force, and so we, uh, and we feel that knowledge is key. So Meredith had mentioned earlier about the need for everybody should know that there is a duty to report. The general statute says that everyone shall report. If you have a reasonable belief that, that abuse is occurring, you shall report this. So the task force in the community, they work with APS, um, they work with, the, you know, sometimes the DA, the clerk of court. We will have, like, like she said, banks. We'll have the hospital. We'll all try to work together in order to do this. But knowledge is key. So, so signs of elder abuse may be missing because individuals and professionals don't know what to look for. Uh -huh. So, so, so knowledge is the key thing for, I think, or the, the largest hurt, hurdle in communities. Yep, yep. You can certainly see that. Um, so in addition, and of course, you've already mentioned that um, Forsyth County has one of these um, MDTs, uh, Detective Slaughter, but what are some additional solutions, either at the local or state level, to address this issue, particularly given Marjorie's caution that a, a lot of folks just don't know what to look for and what to do when they see the signs? And then also, I think, um, t enacting tougher laws. You know, a lot of these people that we arrest and charge for some of these crimes, 
they're somewhat, they can be repeat offenders. Um, they're often these crimes are lower level felonies. They are felony crimes, as Marjorie mentioned, but they're often lower level to where because they're not as violent or as serious as other crimes, they don't quite get the attention sometimes in a prosecutor's office. So we, we've been talking about some upstream things that individuals can do for individual um, people in their family who might be elderly. I want to end this section by talking about some ways communities can take an upstream approach and work to prevent these types of cases rather than responding after the abuse has already occurred. And let me start with you again, Meredith. Well, um, I would say awareness, education is critical. Um, helping older adults and those family members that support them and friends to know the signs of elder abuse, to be able to identify it early on before, um, you know, the, a, a bank account is drained or um, something progresses to a really severe situation. Um, I know in Guilford County, uh, they took a really innovative approach and um, they actually collected what were, uh, they called the 911 center. and. Um, um, documented what the most re frequent 911 calls were from older adults in the community. And they heard it was most uh, often frauds and scams. And as a result, they created a program called Friends Against Fraud. And they uh, gathered together various professionals in their community uh, from multidisciplinary, multidisciplinary professionals uh, to go out and speak uh, to older adults uh, through senior centers and churches and other community uh, events uh, about what uh, to raise awareness to raise education and to um, present all the various channels that exist to responding to these cases. So let's actually take a look at an example of just what you're talking about. It's estimated that older adults lose billions of dollars every year to scams, fraud, and exploitation. NC Impact's David Hurst reports on how Johnston County has been able to raise awareness for how older adults can protect themselves. But I think that this is a good idea no matter what. You know, right. whether we're, we're, WTSB radio has served the Johnston County area for decades. And once we get past the pandemic, it is still going to be a good idea. State Representative Donna White used to be a familiar voice on the station. She co-hosted the Carl and Donna Show, a weekly program that raised awareness about scams targeting older adults. Well, I saw that senior citizens were primarily being targeted because they're vulnerable for many reasons. Uh, their vulnerability usually lies within the area of loneliness. White co-hosted the show for five years with local broadcasting legend Carl Lamb. Listeners would call in and ask questions about particular scams or share their experiences with different types of fraud. You cannot imagine all the different types of, of fraud and scam that has, is going on even as we speak. I think, people are, I think people at least in Johnson County are a little bit smarter now. The Attorney General's office here sees thousands of financial exploitation cases that target the elderly. That's why they recently launched Operation Silver Shield to prevent these types of scams. And when you hear the stories of these absolutely heartless, greedy criminals deceiving people, tricking people, playing on their emotions, playing on their fears to steal what could be their last dollar, uh, it's, it's infuriating. It's absolutely unacceptable. Last year, the Attorney General's office received over 1,000 senior fraud complaints with losses in the millions. Stein says a lot of the complaints deal with some form of phone fraud in which a scammer calls someone and tricks them into wiring them money. At every opportunity, we're out there educating people about what are the types of scams that are going on so that People can be on the lookout, protect themselves, protect their loved ones. And the other thing is when we find these guys, we will go to court. It, it really was a great opportunity, a great platform to get the message out. And while the Carl and Donna show may no longer be on the air, White still continues to warn older adults of what to look out for. If someone just calls you and offers you something that is just absolutely the most exciting thing that you've ever heard, just slap your face a little bit and hang up because it's, it's, it's a scam. Detective, um, help us understand what are some of the most popular scams and fraud that target the elderly? And of course, we realize that many of these originate in other states, maybe other countries. So what, what can a local community do to help prevent these kinds of atrocities? Well, first and foremost, I think a lot of the scams that are currently prevalent are still some of the same scams been going on for years now, they just may have a new twist on them. 
Uh, one of the ones that I've seen quite a bit of recently is uh, like a romance scam where uh, a senior citizen may get involved with a conversation, whether it's on Facebook or social media, they're gonna get involved in a conversation with someone and they think that they're being befriended. Eventually there'll be a relationship. They'll start to develop feelings. The senior citizen develop feelings for the person on the other end of the line and they've never met them. They don't know who it is. They believe it's a female and it very well could have been a male over there, but they're, then they'll ask, um, they'll ask them to send some money or, hey, I need some help. Can you please loan me some money, whatever it may be. So a romance scam, some of those things have turned into, we've had cases recently in, in Forsyth County where uh, we've had packages delivered um, and we've interjected packages uh, of cash. There was a gentleman in Michigan that sent money down here recently uh, to a lady in Winston-Salem who believed he was sending money to help out a, a girlfriend of his that his wife didn't know about uh, allegedly in California. So lots of things didn't mesh with that, but uh, romance scams are still popular. Uh, jury duty scams, IRS scams, where well, people call and pretend to be an official from a government agency. Um, jury duty, of course, are gonna pretend that you're gonna be arrested if you don't show up or you don't pay some type of money uh, because you've allegedly missed jury duty. And a lot of the senior citizens, I think, are vulnerable to this because they, they wanna do the right thing. They're very law-abiding citizens and they're people that want to make sure they follow the rules. And so they get concerned when someone sounds official on the phone. Um, and so they're gonna, they're gonna try to follow through with the orders that may happen. This just makes me so mad. So let me turn to you, Meredith. Marjorie did a really good job of helping us understand which um, types of elder abuse would be committed by caretakers and which ones might be committed by strangers. Help us understand the relative weight. How often is elder financial abuse committed by strangers versus someone who's close to the victim? So there, uh, you know, when we're talking about financial exploitation, falling in these different buckets of, of the scammers, the phone, the internet type of um, financial exploitation, and then there is the the family members, the the friends, the people that build those trusted relationships um, over time. And, and at least one study indicates that family members are um, over 60 percent of the perpetrators of elder financial exploitation. Um, the next highest level were sort of friends, neighbors, uh, people seeing the older adult building those trusted relationships and after that uh, home care in home care aides uh, caregivers that might be professionals hired to come in uh, were around 15% uh, of the cases but when you're talking about uh, elder financial exploitation I mean the numbers the estimates nationally are in the B billions of losses per year so um, even at you know a smaller percentage that may occur through through frauds and scams I mean you're still talking about big dollar amounts Let's stay on this topic for a little bit, even though it's just going to make me that much more mad. Um, Marjorie, talk to us a little bit about what are some of the ways caretakers, friends, and family members take advantage of an older adult's finances? You know, um, I was torn with this one because at times I'm thinking, well, are, am I giving them the ideas? But I need, um, I need seniors to understand these things that are out there. So one of them is that they convince an older adult that they're no longer able to manage their finances. There may have been a mix up on a bill one time or something to that effect. And so now they're like, oh, you can't manage these anymore. Let me take over for you. And then they start taking over. They convince them that uh, at that point to let them become their power of attorney. So, and at the same time, they, they, they then further convince them that once they give them that power of attorney, that they no longer have their rights any longer. And so I do a lot of education explaining to seniors that just because you made somebody your attorney, in fact, that's what they are called. That doesn't mean that you cannot manage your own things anymore. You're still in control and you can revoke this at any given point in time. So they convince them that they're not able to manage their assets. They convince them that they need a power of attorney in place. And then they convince them that they can't handle the, that now that they've named them their attorney, in fact, that they can't handle their assets anymore. And so then after that, the next step is that they'll start to use that power of attorney and use those funds for their own benefit. Now, one of the great things is that in North Carolina in 2018, we adopted the Uniform Durable Power of Attorney Act, at which point that made your attorney, in fact, a fiduciary. 
So what that means is that they're held to a higher standard. So now they can be held civilly and criminally liable for what they do with your finances. If they are not in your best interest, then we have a criminal or civil avenue to pursue them. Then, um, so that's the power of attorney aspect, and then you know, getting in, getting in the seniors' head to convince them that they just can't manage their things anymore. Then also with caretakers, they start a process of isolating. So they get in and they isolate the senior from their family. And then they're like, oh, you don't need to see them. Oh, you know they're taking your money anyway. Again, it's a matter of getting into their head and creating that doubt. And so then they isolate them so that they will no longer, you know, take phone calls from their family or let them visit. And then the next step is, okay, let me become your power attorney. Let me, let me help you with these things because your family isn't. So allow me to help you with these things. So so those are some of the ways that that families and family friends caretakers can get in and take advantage of them meredith marjorie scott i want to thank you for being uh, with us today this is one of those issues that nearly every person in nearly every community in north carolina will have reason at some point to be concerned about and thank you for watching and engaging there are solutions out there if we work together. Tell us what your community is doing or how we can help you. Email us at ncimpact at unc.edu or message us on Twitter or Facebook. Coming up on NC Impact. Hundreds of thousands across our state lack access to fresh, affordable food. We look at a North Carolina community working to build a better local food system. NC Impact is made possible by funding from Civic Federal Credit Union. NC Impact is a production of UNC-TV in association with the University of North Carolina School of Government.